Hi, I'm Jennifer Holt. I'm a professor in the Film and Media Studies Department. And um, I was a grad student of John Caldwell's. He was a great mentor to me. And I feel like watching that film, now you all kind of know what it's like to sit in one of his seminars. <laughs> um, it's just his entire brain all there on the table, and then you, you, it kind of reverberates for the entire week. So um, I felt a lot like I was back in one of his seminars watching that film. Um, in addition to John's many articles and books, he's also um, directed two other films that some of you might have seen, um, Freak Street to Goa, which was about the migratory patterns of hippies um, in India and Nepal, and Rancho California, Por Favor, which was about migrant camps that house indigenous um, workers in Southern California's most affluent suburbs. So John is an artist and a scholar and really a mentor to so many people in this field. I like to think that there's not many people who have jobs in our discipline that don't owe them to, to John in some way. So we're so lucky and happy to, and fortunate to have him here today to talk about this film. Um, do you want to start by kind of contextualizing for the audience how you came to this project and um, talk a little bit about how it developed because there's there's a lot going on there. Yeah, I, uh, by the way, thank you for having me. This is a real honor to be here. Uh, I love this university and this film and media studies department. Um, yeah, I grew up in a very different part of the country um, in a coal mining town and a farm uh, community in rural Illinois, a uh, population about 1,600 people. And um, when I came to California, I, I have been for the last couple of decades in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. West LA is a very different culture. And I think uh, I began to do, well, it was actually the uh, Misteco uh, Indigenous uh, Rancho California project that I got to know uh, the Central Valley a little bit more. Uh, back in 2002 or so, and um, I was taken by it because I think it reminded me of something. I thought I recognized uh, a kind of rural common sense and uh, roots there that reminded me of my childhood. Um, and I tried to look into media representations of the area um, and uh, set about to retrace the, the migrations of the Okies into the Central Valley. Uh, by refilming the locations that Hollywood crews used to document those stories, but also that the FSA photographers did as well. And we did uh, a number of oral histories starting in uh, uh, 2011 uh, and following with real old timers along the way who shared memories uh, of their involvement with those migrations and with the communities. Um, and I, I finished an earlier piece that had a lot of those oral histories in them, uh, but there was something that was missing from that that I, I couldn't quite uh, wrap my head around, and that was uh, there was a kind of populism uh, unfolding in Kern County that I did not recognize. It was alien to me. It was not what I grew up in, a union town uh, in a rural area, and um, it was this this sense of anger or resentment or victimization that uh, really I was, I was taken by, and I was, I've, I've really been trying to understand where that comes from. This, this is a county that voted overwhelmingly uh, for uh, Trump in the last election and stand by him against all odds, even when the labor conditions don't seem to uh, jive with that point of view. It didn't make any sense why I met so many people that would justify the conditions on the ground from the perspective of the corporate interest when they were not part of the corporate interest. So I would go to town hall meetings uh, where um, county government officials would brag about the fact that Kern County had the second highest GDP in the nation, of counties in the nation, productivity wealth. But 50% of the people in that town, in the, in the town of Boron, were on public assistance. What's wrong with that image? Uh, the other thing that I was taken aback by, again, thinking that I knew what populism was, was 
Um, this is the birthplace of the United Farm Workers, but the UFW has a very difficult time getting voted in on any of the operations, uh, the farms in recent years. There's an anti-union ethos there. There's an anti-urban elite ethos. There's an anti-coast ethos. And you hear the sheriff in that final scene basically saying, you know, we're not like the Democrats. We're, we're not a sanctuary city. Uh, we're a law-abiding city. We have law and order here. And it, it was that kind of tension between the predicament of people on the ground and the official politics of this county that just troubled me a great deal. And that's what I was trying to figure out. Why is it that we operate many times, and I would include myself in this, in interest, according to interest other than our own? Um, and, and my hunch was this is far more than an issue of the way we think or feel. Uh, I think the environment that we're in affects that. I think a half century of media and film depictions affects that as well. And so what I'm trying to do here is to connect those three registers, align them with each other, and see if they tell us anything about uh, the kind of contention and the resentment uh, that goes on in these places uh, so on the one hand, there's the on-screen depictions uh, of these folks, uh, and then there is the kind of in-the-ground uh, extraction economy, which uh, takes immense resources out. And then finally, I think there's uh, impacts on the body that are part of this as well. So it's, it's, it's a fairly open-ended parallel structure to this thing. But I do think that the landscapes we're in and that we've created and engineered do affect the way we think. I think it's also the way we think out loud. And those landscapes you see here really are, are very so, sobering and overwhelming at times. So it's terrible that you had three heart attacks while you were making this film. Did you, and then I, I was thinking, when you were editing it and making it, did you think while you were having the heart attacks or after, this is gonna be really good for the film? Or like how, when, at what point did you start weaving the heart attacks into your vision of this um, kind yeah. of very dystopian, hmm. sad, multi-layered catastrophe that you kind of laid out for us. Because I, I knew it needed a happy ending. Yeah. So I, that, that, was the way I do that. Uh, that was at the very, very late in the process, in the last six or nine months. And I, I realize that part of what's going on in the caricaturing that we do in our current culture wars, that these kind of red versus blue state elite uh, situation that we're in now, is that we've created a false kind of unity called rural culture or red states or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and in fact, as you see from the film, there's I think that's a useless term unless you acknowledge the racial and ethnic diversity that exists in these communities, unless you acknowledge the class divisions in these uh, small rural and farm towns. There's a huge amount of diversity and conflict that is never acknowledged on 24-7 cable news when they, we hear it every night, the back and forth, uh, the binary that's created by Fox News and MSNBC, that is not a useful framework to go out and do field work with or, or political work with or anything like that. Uh, part of what I was trying to do is just to problematize the idea of country folk, rural people, uh, and to think about what life is like in these communities where all of the aquifers have been destroyed, where, where the, the land has been completely changed and uh, through excavation, farming, mining, oil, oil drilling, fracking, I mean, you just go on and on and on. Uh, I, th I think you can think about stress, stressors, as part of the environment in communities where there are terrible labor conditions, but they vote 90% in favor of Trump and his agenda. Why, why is that? Uh, I, so, so what I'm trying to do is simply acknowledge the stress that I think exists on all of these other levels 
because uh, the red states are also brown. There's a massive Latino workforce, not just in the Central Valley, but in Illinois where I grew up, in Iowa where I worked on farms, and Indiana and Nebraska and everywhere else. And that's never part of the political debate that goes on on cable news, is the mm -hmm. complexity of these places. They're run on the backs of a kind of diverse workforce and the like. And so the other thing that was happening, I think as you pointed out, is I realized when I, when I hooked up with Florentino Castellon and Tezomach, I realized they were trying to make infrastructure with nothing. They had no capital. They had no anything. And they were scrambling with whatever they had to put together something that would enable them to put, make a 40-acre farm that produces produce that can be regularly distributed both in Kern County but in South Central LA, which it still is to this day. So you can still buy you know, produce boxes from South Central farmers that way. So, I mean, it was just this kind of attempt to build the pipes and the irrigation in a, in a county that was stopping them over and over again that I found endearing. Uh, and it actually reminded me of something I thought about growing up on a farm, working on bailing crews, is that even at that age, I thought the most creative artists in the world are farmers. They, they can make incredible things with nothing. And you have to get below the level of the corporate agriculture and industrial farming to find out what happens for the really precarious people in these counties that are completely erased. And you see that with the African Americans as well. So the last shot of the scene, you actually have the Ornalis couple. Uh, you know, she's worrying about what's going to happen when her husband dies of a heart attack. I mean, this, you know, these are hard, hard lives that these people face. And I think it affects their, their kind of outlook and everything else. So it was an intuitive kind of connection that I was making. And I thought um, that stress uh, was something we could engage with and reflect upon on all these other levels as well. So, um, yeah, I think that really worked. I'm I'm also interested in the approach you took, um, you know, structurally and how mm -hmm. complex all of these issues are that you're dealing with, and then you chose to create this very complex structure in order to tell that story. Um, and you know, we have a lot of students who make films. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really interested in how you develop the script since you're doing so many things at one time and how you started to keep all these different dimensions together. Um, yeah. The plight of those who work the land and the theme of your heart attack and fragile white masculinity and all of those different components that you kind of laid out. I imagine it's kind of like putting together pieces of a puzzle, but you know, why did you make some of those choices instead of what might have been like an easier way to go about it? Just a nice linear yeah. story. Well, I, I would say it was probably a bad decision in no, I love strategically, and I'll tell you why. There, there is, this is the golden age of documentary, but most of the great films out there that are getting circulation are, are story films, they're, they're narrative-based, almost high concept. Uh, and that's not the way I think, that's not the way I stumble around and, and, and land that I shouldn't be on, that's not the way I make images, that's not the, and it doesn't interest me, quite frankly, but if, if you want a wider distribution, you need to figure the story part out. I think there's a bit of narrative in this, but uh, not, you know, it's kind there of- There is, I mean, the, actually, it, the more you watch it, I, this is my third time seeing it, it's clear as a bell to me, the narrative, and it just stays with you and it keeps eating at you. I like this approach. I mean, okay. I think this one is so much more compelling, well, but I'm just interested yeah, in so, you know, so what, how you come one to this One of the, the frustrating things, the, the first, there was an earlier version, a film I finished in 2016 that I showed at probably a half dozen or eight different venues and universities uh, that was called Bore on the Button Willow. And, and that one, I, we literally went every, every mile down Highway 58 from Barstow uh, through Boron, Edwards, Mojave, Bakersfield, Button Willow, McKittrick, Taft. And it was, it was a road movie documentary, and we did oral histories at every one of these places. Uh, collected 10 times the amount of material as you see in this film. And uh, I thought 
it was powerful to listen to 94 year olds wheezing on camera trying to remember what uh, the Xana crew looked like when they went into the weed patch camps and things like that, right? But I had this interesting screening experience uh, at one place where several people said, this is just great. Forget the film, just make a database and let people go through it, go, go online and, and kind of dig through the data and put all this stuff together, it's very democratic. It, th that idea used to seem very radical and kind of interesting formally and I thought, is, have I just spent six years creating a database? <laughs> You know, and, and uh, these old people didn't apparently appeal. They, they didn't talk fast enough they, or something. I mean, it was, it was a two hour experience to go down the highway. And some of the same things show up. The, the mine war that I did film was in that, in that. But it was, I think, that comment that I thought, if that's the response I get, that this is just a collection of materials, what I'm going to do is just cut through all that stuff and try to put together a kind of logic that I see on the ground of structurally, what are the foundations of this kind of proud white masculinity that exists in this place? What are the principles of it? You know, the Ten Commandments or the, the Bill of Rights, you know, God, law and order, whiteness, uh, you know, work. Uh, to, and that's really the structure that I have here. Mm -hmm. is, is a, and, and I think of it as kind of a poetics uh -huh. of white masculinity uh, in that particular area. And, and those are the kind of things that I think fuel the political disposition in the area as well. So uh, if there's a place for a poetics of, of film, that's what this is. If there's a place for a poetics of a kind of ideology, that's where this would fit. It is a complex film, though I, I get it, and it, it, it doesn't fit the it doesn't fit the high concept of linear narrative approach that rules now and is fundable. So that's what I would say to the, to the mm -hmm. film students, understand what you're getting mm -hmm. into, and I think there are market implications to the kind of forms or genres that you use. Mm -hmm. so. um, I was also struck by the contrast of your commitment to authenticity by re-photographing and re-filming you know, that you set up in the beginning with the, um, all the stand-ins that you consistently show us mm -hmm. that Hollywood uses. And um, I'm interested in if you can talk a little bit about the way that, you know, your commitments to verification and archives mm -hmm. and all of that and what you're, how you're using that to kind of comment on what you see as um, maybe inauthentic portrayals coming out of Hollywood. Yeah, you know, I this. They, it, Tesla does talk about uh, a kind of, he has a theory of authenticity. Um, you know, I, I guess in, in some ways, uh, I was talking to George Lipsitz before the screening about phenomenology, and, and I, I think there is a kind of grounded engagement with a space, a place, a community, with people in a neighborhood and, and a landscape that provides a, a far more vivid index of what's going on in a place to me than a kind of hit and run uh, situation that, that location filming typically involves. And I understand it, I've worked on location with you know, real crews that do it industrially, professionally, and all of that. But I, I just think a lot is lost. And I just th think that the bubbles that are created, so Kern County Chamber of Commerce brags about the fact that they've had over 500 feature films shot there. But the actual political infrastructure hates the Hollywood elites. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Well, <laughs> money connects us. And so they're willing to engage on that level, but continue the shrill rhetoric of condemnation of government overreach, big government, all these other things, right? I'm in these communities going, well, isn't that what this town needs is, is a bigger government uh -huh. that will regulate the groundwater, clean, it, clean up the environment, and do these other things. So, um, yeah, I, 
So I, I think what I'm, I'm trying to do is stumble off the highway and look at things closely, that all those wrecks, those hulking uh, cinder block and concrete ruins that I was in, those were all parts of bombing runs at, at North Edwards Air Force Base. The earlier version, actually, I got the footage of the, the uh, World War II planes that were bombing these things and, and later. So, uh, I, 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 I like to stumble around through the ruins of these, uh, these kind of filmic representations as well. Um, yeah. I mean, the other thing is, I think you, you challenged me a week ago, a, a week or so ago, about the fact that maybe I was being too, too easy on the kind of cultural politics of this area, right? I was just really struck by how sympathetic and compassionate okay. and what a kind of open heart you have for um, a, a population that not a lot of people do have that for <laughs> at this time. Okay, and, and I, what I, in thinking about that, I, I was thinking about how would you feel? Sometimes we don't understand the irrationality of a radical right, for example, right? But if all you have seen for over a half century or century are images of country folk as dumb, large, slow thinking, and stupid, how are you going to feel? What kind of rapprochement or engagement can you have with urban communities? That's a nasty, deep-seated, embedded uh, predicament that we in Hollywood have put people in. And so the irrational kind of anger that exists now in the culture wars, I, th I think we have to acknowledge we were involved. What was it? What's the deal? That, 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 that image of rural people is an invention of outsiders, right? And they're, they're an easy mark. Uh, you know, every narrative or comedy has to have a target, and that's an easy mark. But you know, now we're in a situation where we can't figure out the way why the red states have now gerrymandered the electoral college and things like that. I think these are deep-seated kind of dispositions. And the mutual contempt that exists, there, there are reasons for it. I don't, I'm not justifying it or anything else. It's just like I want to understand what the history has been between these two. So rather than think just about a caricature of Blue state elites in the urban areas, coastal areas, and, and Midwestern or red states, rural folk or values or family values, I'm trying to figure out what the connections are between these two. And lands, land, resources, that's part of the connection that exists right now, that exists 24-7. Uh, and, and I think, well, there are economics uh, involved too. So capital comes from LA. So it, it's real easy to look out there at Kern County and say, these crazy people, how can they be sucking all the wealth out of the land, sending all the chemical waste from the drilling and fracking back into the, the freshwater aquifers? How could anybody do that? They're all kind of stupid or insane to do that. But where does that come from? That's capital from Los Angeles and San Francisco and elsewhere. That's, that's you know, national and transnational oil investments. Uh, and, and the same thing's happening to agriculture. There's a lot of Los Angeles money coming in. So it's, that's what interests me is. We can, we can hammer each other right and left on and on and on, but if we don't acknowledge that we are connected through financial exchange and through resource extraction, then I don't think we, we can, we're going to solve the kind of um, contention or conflict that exists now. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. When you saw the, um, you know, the Gillette commercial, first of all, how long have, were you working on this film? Well, I, I first went up there in 2010, uh, and then I... Ugh. 2010 to 2016, so we, we finished that oral history road movie, Born on the Button Willow. And then I went back and, I, uh, and then we recreated this thing. So it's been over 10, uh, what, eight or nine years, okay. probably. But I, obviously, it's, it's what you can do when you work full time somewhere else. I head up there on weekends. <laughs> it's my therapy. I got to go out and get 
uh, into to predicaments like this to, uh, I don't know, survive in a university environment where you have real politics you know, and real conflict. Yeah. So, so, and okay. the heart attacks happened in 2013, so midway through this. Anyway. Okay. So when you recently saw the Gillette ad, and for those of you who might not have seen it, there's a recent ad by Gillette Razors, what, which is saying um, men can do better. There's a culture of masculinity that has been mm. um, become uh, toxic in many ways in terms of abuse and uh, abuse towards women and bullying and all types of things, and the the commercial I thought was really uh, poignant and kind of thoughtful and had a hopeful message. And the reaction to that was uh, not what I would have expected, but um, quite pro kind of kind of seems to be coming straight out of your film. And I'm wondering if when you saw this ad and the reaction, if you felt like the whole world needs to see my film right this second, because this is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, I read a lot about the Gillette ad, uh -huh. but I haven't seen it. Okay. So I, I probably shouldn't comment on okay. that. And I think I'm at a stage But it's my... kind of, I mean, the whole thing, the struggles, the circular struggles over labor and gender, all of the, these things have not gone away, right? They just keep right. popping up and reinventing okay. themselves. So this, you're this, kind of... This is why you need to take a complex systems approach to these problems. And it, it's not kind of re-education. We're, we're going to send men out to the re-education camps. <laughs> It's the precarity in these local communities that I think turn people against each other, right? The, the, the interracial tension in the 1920s and 30s in those camps, because we talked to a lot of people about that, is what happens when you starve your workers or don't pay them enough and you don't allow them to unionize, you kill the union organizers, which they did in the 30s, and they bring the highway patrol in and the sheriff to do that. You create a situation where everybody is struggling individually. Groups turn on each other. Men turn on women. There is no collective ethos in those situations. So I don't think, and I think the environmental catastrophe in the Central Valley does the same thing. So I'm not saying that solves men's problems. But if, if you actually cultivate an environment that promoted the collective welfare of these communities in the communities, I, I think you would have less acting out. And, and that's what's the most troubling, you know, that, that business, you know the history of the Okies, it, it's like the, there was interracial conflict at that point as well, and the FSA photographers couldn't, weren't going to report the fact that, you know, two-thirds of these workers in, in the Central Valley were workers of color. Uh, so, so, so what I would argue for, and there's, there's no easy fix to this, but you've got to intervene in common sense ways to make it possible to earn a living in these environments. You don't have to extract that much wealth without returning it to the local community. So the people who are sucking massive amounts of wealth, resource, ag products, oil, gas, everything out of these, they're paying some tax but let's step up to the plate, big boys. The, the gender problem is not down on the men acting out local. The gender problem is the corporate, you know, kind of vultures that try to maximize profits for finance capitalism. Yeah, your film is kind of the answer to it. It can't really be encapsulated in a 60 second or a 30 second ad. But if they, if they okay. saw the film, I just was struck by the timing and like that we're all watching this now and yeah. um, the way that your film kind of lays out some of the more complex dynamics behind these tensions. Hmm. You know, it was fun to watch a group struggle to get off the ground like the South Central Farmers Collective in Buttonwillow uh, because Tezo and Florentino are not Marxist, they're not leftist, right? The only game in town is there is a market economy. If you can figure out how to grow produce, you can sell it and make money and feed yourselves. So they, they create a cooperative environment 
that operates differently than a traditional corporation. Uh, and they have to attend to the needs of each other to make that work. They have to be really aware of who's in the food processing house in Sun Valley, in the, in the San Fernando Valley, who's delivering to the city sites with, with the, the gardens and all of that kind of stuff. And so it, it, takes, it takes a bit of collective work. You've got to care, I think, to make those relationships more mm -hmm. mutual, to, to, to bring more reciprocity in. And so it, I, I just love seeing a situation where people figure out how to move ahead and acknowledge other people's needs rather than to say, you know, you, you're, you're fired or I, I can fire you or I'll hire you or whatever. And so, um, so uh, Florentino Castellon, the older uh, Latino here, was a uh, um, consultant economic advisor to three California governors. And that's because Gray Davis, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Jerry Brown hadn't a clue about what you do in West Kern County. How, how, how can we help these, these people, right? So they find a smart, creative guy. He's out inventing things. And we have, he's in the, you know, talking about his roots uh, where he learned from his father, who was a Mexican uh, foreman on a ranch. Uh, they had nothing, but they made everything they needed from junk, from scratch or whatever. So it's that kind of inventive, it's not resistance in a kind of Marxist sense, but it's resistance, it's creativity that allows some people to come to the table and come to the market where they can make money, where they can make a living and that sort of thing. So uh, I, I'm, I'm beginning to appreciate the complexity of what it takes to survive outside of a university environment where it's all very clear about what radical action might be. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and so the fact that they're doing this in that environment, I have a tremendous amount of respect uh -huh. for. So after being immersed in all of this, and John studies labor, in the media industries and writes about that too. So you're, you think, you, you've been thinking about labor in so many mm -hmm. contexts, right? Yeah. And I feel like when we're watching this movie, we're also very aware of your labor um, and its toll that it, it has taken on your body as well as the toll that the labor takes on the bodies of the, of the workers. And um, I'm mm -hmm. wondering if, you, if your views on labor have evolved as you've gone through this process of making this film, are you, um, are you more depressed than you were before? Are you more hopeful? Yeah. Are your thoughts more, com obviously your thoughts are always complex. Do you have like 12 different points about <laughs> how you've come out of thinking about labor after all this? or? Because got, I've got to think that there's been some evolution in your yeah. attitudes. You know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not in a pessimistic mode now. I, I've come through that physiological experience. I am the luckiest person alive. Uh, I also stumbled into a, a position at a university, which I can't believe. Uh, and so... I'm actually quite I optimistic. Believe. No, no, I have lots of ideas about, about things. Now, the, the, I do media industries research, and there was a book I published in 2008 called Production Study, Production Culture, uh, and I took basically the same approach that I took here, where I, we have a tendency when we study industry to go inside or outside, right? There's, and, and you know, if we can interview the right people, then we understand what goes on. Or if we're on the outside, we have distance and we can analytically do it you know, without bias. That's the classic battle. But I've always thought you get nothing on the inside with those kind of interviews, except talking points that are scripted by the corporation. So what I studied for that book, I, that was a 10-year project, uh, I just talked to as many people as I could in every layer of the industry out to the margins. And that gets really interesting because you're not talking to people who have made it uh, or who are acting like they're self-made. You're talking to people who are aspirational, who are marginal, 
or maybe you know, have dealt with ages or whatever. So these all give you different perspectives to understand the film and television industries. And I'm interested in the space they're in, uh, the environment, the kind of cultural uh, implications and that sort of thing. And I, I simply took that thick description out into the Central Valley and I did the same kind of project for this film. So I, 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 when, we, when I teach a methodology class, I, I am acutely inductive in the way I approach things, which means you drink a lot of caffeine and then you go out and you collect everything you can. I am like a vacuum cleaner. When I, when I go into a media production environment, the same thing. If, if I can take pictures, I'll do that. I'll you know, get every kind of paratext or industrial text or whatever. Uh, artifacts, tools, uh, trade literature, et cetera, and I do that out in the field as well. Uh, but the question is about labor, right? So I, I've had, I actually have had some students I, challenge me in class. This happened not too long ago. I was showing Silicon Valley and talking about precarity. And one or two students would have none of this. Stop it. You cannot say that. Do not play a violin for those people in Silicon Valley. And I said, I get it. Let's talk. You know, uh, we'll, we'll. And I went up and I asked him, well, where are you from? West Virginia, coal mining town, right? So I go, OK, I get what you're talking about here, right? There's precarity, and then there's precarity. Mm -hmm. And you know, the precarity of you know, really successful focus pullers and gaffers or grips might enable them still to own a house in Chatsworth, right? But the precarity of the Latino farm workers who are not unionized in the Valley, no, it's a different level. It's a different phenomenological level. One's no better than the other or less, but it's just like I have to be honest about those differences. And, you know, I think I'm at the, I'm as engaged, I'm in, those things concern me. Those differences concern me. So I don't want to do labor studies that just collapse the thing. And every, you know, we can talk about neoliberal capitalism, this and that, and global, you know, transnational capitalism and finance capitalism, which are large abstractions that you know a lot more about than I do. But when you do cultural work on the ground in communities, it's just like you be very careful about how you generalize about the predicament people are in. And so it's just, it, it's these, these specificities I, I'm, I'm really committed to trying to document. Yeah, and it seems that with every film and every book that you're, you're able to even give us a kind of richer picture of how to do the work if we want to do it too, or if we want to yeah. try. Um, let's open it up to the audience if people have questions. Um, Thank you so much. Um, so I, I want to connect with that last point that you made in terms of thinking about it in the sort of film and media uh, uh, genre. Um, so given the concerns about the Hollywood intersection with this geographic region, um, in terms of maybe the political, the environmental, the labor concerns that you've raised, um, do you think that there's maybe certain ethical concerns that we should think about in terms of the Hollywood side of continuing to engage with this region? And could we maybe consider this film a provocation for these film media sort of like blue state industries? Hmm. It might be those things. I, 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 would, I would have a difficult time aspiring to such a goal. You know, one of the reasons I love teaching at a university is because I now believe that's where you can facilitate the most change, right? And, and so, I am defenseless. I have no ability or power to critique a corporation. But I have scores of former students that are now percolating through all of these industries and production houses and boutiques and everything else, and they've got good heads on their shoulders. You know, there's a common sense, there's a critique of gender politics, there's an understanding. So, I really think public education in particular is a hugely important place. And I think, you know, I thought this was a documentary or an art film, but I realized in watching it tonight, it's, it's really a, a film professor's film about media representations or something. Maybe it's a classroom exercise, but 
so, so, so that's, that's kind of the way I see any kind of critique I would come at, up with. It's, it, in some ways, it's a difficult film to circulate in a mainstream, but I think it has a place uh, in, a, in other environments, a provocation. That's an interesting question. Uh, just in, in, and I think other people have written about this in terms of what uh, tax incentives have done to state and local and regional film commissions and economies in other parts of the country where they come in offering these huge economic benefits and then they leave when the tax breaks are better somewhere else. And, and the, 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 the numbers don't add up in the way that they, they should. Uh, the thing is now, filmmaking really is a, is, a, is a national enterprise. Every major city has a scene. Every major city has a dozen film festivals. That, you know, there's 10 times the film festivals there were 20 years ago. Uh, so there is economic and cultural activity all over the country. And I think, I don't know what the future is, but that's, that's a hopeful sign to me that the, the indigenous, indigenous growing regional industries, I think, are a healthier solution to this than runaway production, where Hollywood thinks that it can drop its, you know, half million here or wherever in a local economy. That's going to be problematic forever. Uh, so, good. thank you for your question, though. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the hinges that I'm observing, perhaps wrongly, uh, between uh, embodied knowledge and then bodily crisis and age in the film. Because yeah. I'm seeing the threads, but I can't quite tie them together. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, this film, by this point, there, there's a lot of hunches and intuitions here. Uh, I feel the age in my body when I try. In fact, I was building a fence, a farm fence, when I had my first heart attack. And I didn't tell anybody about it because I was in denial. Because I'm a runner. I had a heart-healthy diet for 40 years. Nothing wrong with me. Can't be. I, th I just thought it was a massive uh, muscle spasm or something. And I, I took care of it in my own way, which is stupid. Don't ever do that. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, the other thing you realize is you, you see Florentino, who's been at this, he was working in the field long before Gray Davis and Jerry Brown as an eight-year-old. Remember, farm labor, child labor is still allowed in farming because of old uh, ideas about family work. And so you, in that last scene, there's uh, Robert Ornales is moving off into the sunset in his motorized wheelchair on his farm in Buttonwill, and there's Florentino just kind of creaking off. You, so so I, I identify with the bodies of these men who do this work. First job I ever had was on a loading dock in a feed mill. One of the jobs I had in, on the Mississippi, uh, uh, and I, I realized that all of the men over 35 or 40 were on the forklifts, but they hired 17 and 18 year olds to do all the like manual labor. The fact is, if you do that kind of labor, you are done for. You know, if you don't figure out a way to move out of those physical trades uh, by the time you're middle age, you're in big, big trouble because your bodies don't mm -hmm. work anymore. So I, I, I do empathize with that. I, I find what they're doing not just create heroic in some ways, but it's creative. I mean, they're, they're figuring out ways to survive. Mortality is certainly part of this. Aging, the destruction of this environment. Mm -hmm. It's just like, that blows me away. What does my future death have to do anything? The aquifers that they're pumping their waste into are a half a million years old. Right, they're going way down to do this. And so, who cares about that? I don't know. It turns out, all those numbers that I cited there, about 700 times the amount of benzene, you know, 500 times the amount of perchlorate, or whatever it happens to be, those were all in the oil companies self-reporting to Sacramento. 
That was a story that the LA Times broke a, a year and a half or two ago. And so they, they know this stuff is happening. They're turning it in, but they know that there's an understaffed department up in Sacramento. They didn't read any of this stuff. And then they would go, oh my gosh, are we doing this? So water is the lifeblood of that place. And you have you know, good, solid market-based business practices that are just destroying the infrastructure. The physical resource infrastructure is being destroyed systematically. And it's like above the ground, it's an arid desert on that part of the county, underground. I didn't realize until I went out and did this and I talked to some of these drillers, there are hundreds of gallons of water that are used just to drill. Not, it's not just fracking. They've done this forever. Back 100 years when oil was discovered in the Central Valley, and all of that waste comes up with heavy metals and other things and gets put somewhere. So you, what I show there are all of those pools, unlined drainage pools, where <laughs> all of this stuff is just seeping in the soil. So I do think about mortality. I don't think about my own as much as I do about the kind of maniacal scale of this kind of self-abuse that we sanction. And many of the people that I love and respect that I interviewed will still defend these companies because they're job creators. They're hiring me, right? So I, I get that. And, and it's, that's the thing I get the most upset about, not the kind of mortality. But it, it's an interesting question. The embodied part, I think, is, a, is an important part of this. So thank you. I think you tried to show the complexity, the problem, and the interrelationships between, you know, the the uh, West Coast and the Central Valley. But I think maybe by the choice of your quotes and the, the images that you showed of the Valley people, particularly the white males, are you in danger there of, of creating such a stereotype, mm -hmm. especially when one sees the film for the first time and doesn't perceive all of its complexity? Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the, the individuals, we there's not actually a lot of white, men that I have left in this film. We did oral histories. There's a guy named Earl Shelton in Weed Patch. He's 96 years old. He was an Okie. He remembers Xanax crew, Grapes of Wrath. We, we have all that. Uh, there's complex ambiguities to what he says. What, what I show the most in this film, the, the human figures that are shown in this film are mostly Latinos, Florentino Castellon and Tozozo Mock, uh, and, and then Terry Judd is the ILWU uh, union organizer out in Boron. Um, I do think maybe, you know, I don't deny that there's probably problematic aspects to this, and this will make people angry. Uh, but most of the images I have of this angry, white masculinity are from other texts that I've, I've woven in. And so I'm trying to contrast these, um, the kind of phenomenological realities on the ground with media representations where you do see this kind of machismo show up over and over again. Um, I also, this doesn't answer your question, I, I do realize that these are tough times to say anything about politics. And I'm surprised we haven't gotten into more of a fight here over this. I spent a lot of time in the red states talking to family members and others in Texas and Arkansas and Nebraska about what's going on. In August, we were down in Texas with a family, um, in, in my extended family, um, that have been Democrats that are heavily involved in nonprofit work that are altruistic in the best sorts of ways that are engaged, they care about the community. And I said, hey, what, what's going on with the child separation policy at the border? And the response was, what? What child separation policy at the border? And I said, well, it's been in the news for a week or two, never heard of it, right? This is West Texas, big area. Uh, and I said, They've been arguing about this in the United Nations. This is worldwide news. These are human rights abuses that are happening in Texas along the border. 
what are you guys doing about it? And he was just blank. He didn't know this had happened. How can that happen? Then I realized this region of West Texas is, an, has a kind of, is a news desert or a fact desert. All the local newspapers are now franchise operations. They're syndicated. So I don't know where the news comes from, but it just blew my mind that he wasn't somehow in that environment where there were TVs at the cafes downtown and elsewhere, but they, they were showing a network you could probably guess. Uh, but it was really, you realize that the media and the press are missing from large parts of the country. So, um, you know, I don't know why I offer that anecdote, except that I, I, I do care about this. I do argue and cajole people that I know in red states areas. It's, 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 it's not an easy process to find consensus with folks, but it, it can be done. Uh, so anyway, thank you for your question. I, I, I do think this is an open-ended film. I, my background is in the arts and experimental filmmaking, and Brecht and other people you know, really at one point in history pushed us to make open-ended art that didn't have closure, that narrative brought. And I think this is an open-ended piece that does ask a lot of a viewer. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of viewers in my extended family who wouldn't sit through this. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> two of them a week ago, I thought this was the coming out of the film the people who care the most about me and my ideas and my family. And I turn the lights down and put the Blu-ray in and we're watching with the sound up and I look over five minutes in and they're both <laughs> snoring. And I thought, oh, that hurts. But I get it. it th there's a certain kind of film language I'm using here which is not everybody's cup of tea and it's a kind of cultural specific thing. I thank you for being such a good audience and engaging with me on this film uh, now that I've come out of the darkness of the editing room after several years and shown it, so. Well, we wanna thank, thank you for bringing your scholarship and your art thank and you. your passion for education and for making us think and for you know giving us open-ended art that is still hopeful. <laughs> um, so help, please help me thank John Caldwell. Thank you very much. And come on back with your next film. Okay, I will do that. And thanks to all of you.